G'day viewers, oh, I've got Adrian Times here again and we're going to be talking about the Casimir effect. So, um, previously we've spoken about uh, general politics and another one about nanotech, but now we're going to be talking about the Casimir effect. Um, but before we do, uh, it has a lot to do with virtual particles, so I think it's worth discussing what are virtual particles. Um, virtual particles are particle and antiparticle pairs that appear, flip around a bit, and then usually collide and annihilate, like matter and antimatter do, uh, with exceptions uh, such as at the edge of black holes. So if one falls in, the other falls out. This is how black holes evaporate. Um, so that then leads into what the Casimir effect is. Particles have size. So Dutch physicist Nima Casimir theorized that if you had two parallel metal plates really close together, like a micron or less apart, um, perfectly parallel, yada, yada, yada. Uh, the larger wavelength particles could not appear between them, but can still appear outside, resulting in a pressure differential that pushes the place together. Uh, this then, uh, it, this was not measurable at the time, it was middle uh, 20th century. A few decades later, it be, was measurable, um, and to us in experimental accuracy, his three po er, er, proved out. So, that's the, the, the Casimir effect in the nutshell. Again, it only appears at really, really small length scales, less than a micron, and typically less than 100 nanometers. So. Okay, so, um, yes, yeah, so virtual particles uh, do exist. They're, uh, they're, they're not the same as um, particles uh, that we see around us that um, persist for long periods of time. They have very short half-lives. Uh, how long do they exist for? For instance, can you give us a, a ballpark? Um, well, milliseconds usually, if that. Mm, right. Okay. And where is this? Where is this energy actually coming from? Do we know? Um, there are a few theories as to where it comes from. Uh, generally, you can consider the fabric of the universe uh, is what most of the theories have pan out to. Mm -hmm. um, it's basically the energy is exists. Mm -hmm. It doesn't necessarily come from any place. It's it's just there. Okay, all right. So um, we've discussed what virtual particles are and moved into what the Casimir effect is. Casimir effect is. So, well, how can we expect to use uh, Casimir effect? What are the real world problems that this could solve? Um, if it works out, what are the what do you see are the possible future applications? Well, people are still working on what exactly the applications are. Um, one application a lot of people thought was, well, gee, this is a force that does something to things in a certain shape, so let's tap up the power. Problem is, it's a conservative force. It's like a spring. Yeah, you can get energy out of the plates being pushed together. You have to put the same amount of energy in to get them back apart. Um, so most efforts to tap the Casimir effect for power wind up uh, as perpetual motion machines and don't work for the same reason. Um, they get energy out when you push it in, you push them apart, you put the energy back in, you lose some bits of friction, and eventually it's a net loss. Uh, people have been able to use this to like store energy as a capacitor, like you got parallel plates, you can get energy out, and then you put them back in, um, and that's a standard energy store, and that works just fine. Um, further, it's also useful for manipulating stuff at the nanoscale. It's also a bit of a problem if you're not watching out for that. Because you got two things in a certain configuration, and it's like magnetics. One of them jumps up to the other, you can move them about, and then put a bit of energy into pull them back out where you want them. Okay. Has this project, well, you've got a project um, on at the moment. Now, it's it's been a bit dormant recently because of lack of funding. Do you want to discuss this project and um, what, you'd, yeah, what, what, so what you'd like to do? There are a few investigations, uh, mine among them. To so uh, so all most of the investigation of Casimir is what happens with the middle or with the parallel plates. But what happens if you have uh, different configurations, like say uh, at a slant or the ball to parallel plates still attracts, but a few other things have been tried. Um, so I'm doing another investigation, and what I'm looking into is. The, the, a, a possible end run around the having to put energy back in. Um, what I've got is a configuration that, in short, should be able to use the Casimir effect to cause a rotation, a torque, rather than a linear. Um, I wish I had a, a diagram uh, handy. I could 
they'll shoot you one after the interview so you can uh, post it or link to it. Mm -hmm. um, or or can I screen share really quick? Or Yeah, sure. Um, that's fine. Uh, okay, let's see if I can uh, find the appropriate file. Yeah. I'm just just while you're doing that, I'm, I often wonder like um, a lot of people may disregard this because it sounds too much like a, um, to them it might sound a lot like the perpetual motion machines that have failed miserably in the past. <laughs> Do you find yeah, people have it, and like lumped into the same category? Here is um, I've actually done the analysis for the various checks and for the various forces. Um, and run them by a bunch of academics, and it actually pans out. Hmm. Um, it pans out to a very, 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 very small amount, like it, a nanowatts, a, a, even in the first generation device. But okay, got the file. Um, how can we insert this file into the video screen? I don't know. <laughs> I don't know if it's possible. Um, I imagine the best way to do it would be to print it and hold it up, <laughs> given my current understanding of how Skype works. <laughs> and unfortunately, I do not have a printer how right about, here. Oh, yeah, well. yeah, we can link to it. That's fine. <laughs> okay, well, I'm, yeah. I'm sending you the file, and you can uh, link to it, uh, it later. Check the check the description, folks, um, and yeah, it will be there. Right. Uh, the, the the specific image is part of the patent that's been granted on this. Sure. Uh, Patent Office has already reviewed it and said it's possible it, enough that uh, they're willing to grant it. So um, mm -hmm. this particular image is part of public domain already. Okay. The That's public cool. domain being uh, what the patent is. So. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well. Okay. Um, so what would you do if you got funding um, to pursue this further? What? what, um, what, what try what to find of... a fab that can uh, replicate. That can do this. Uh, part of the problem is that this requires uh, constructing rather complex components on the 30 to 50 nanometer scale. Uh, when I tried this initially, we could it, it was almost barely possible, but not really. We kept wanting to get sharp edges, and we kept getting blobs instead. And so we kept refining technique until the funding we had for it ran out. Hmm. Right. Uh, that said, that was a few years ago, and uh, technology marches on, so it may be possible these days. You mean with advances in nan nanotechnical material sciences? Uh, specifically, EDM lithography and other methods of uh, of nanofabrication. EDM is the one that we specifically were investigating to do this. Okay, all right, all right. So, um, okay, let's. If you did get funding and you did have access to this technology, how fast do you think the project would move forward? Um. Again, that that depends on how good the technology is. I have the process flow. I have everything. Um, in theory, we could have an experiment ready in a month hmm. if okay. we had everything ready to go. Um, right. Yeah, right. That's going to happen, even if I had all the funding in the world. But in theory, that could it, it could move that fast. More likely, it's going to take several years to pull all the resources necessary to do this together. Right. Um, how do you normal? How would you go about attracting venture capitalists, for instance, interested in that may be interested in funding something like this? What would you say? This is too early stage for venture capital. It is still a scientific theory. It is not yet completely proven. Right. It's it builds on what's known, and it it is actually one of these gray areas that we don't know whether this will work or not. Um, if it doesn't, then it, uh, it illuminates some other ways to manipulate the Casimir effect, which will have other uses. Uh, nano manipulation, for instance. If it does, then of course there's a way to get very small amounts of energy out of this, mm -hmm. which might so. be useful. For instance, if you're traveling from uh, you're breaking up again, uh, which might be useful. Um, you know, in the far future when you're traveling into space and you, there, there are yeah. no energy sources nearby. Yes. Right. Space is definitely a uh, primary application for this kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. So, what sort of person would you see funding something like this at the, at the current stage? Um, NSF, mm -hmm. uh, uh, DARPA, those uh, uh, standard uh, basic science uh, grants. So, if anybody from NSF and DARPA have are subscribed to my channel and listening to this. This is for you. <laughs> um, let's hope they are. So, well, yeah. some people might be of um, might might have heard of something like this that uh, a, a young Egyptian lady was pursuing a few years back, 
She made a proposal about um, how to utilize virtual particles for powering spaceflight over long distances. But it's, yeah. Um, what, it, what, what are your it's thoughts on that? It's one of these attempts to uh, tap the Casimir effect that had the parallel plates and forgot to account for the energy having to be put back into the system. Right. But that That's the entire point of my thing, is it gets around that flaw because so many people have tried to use it and they keep stumbling over this. I mean, a step two or three of this after having the idea was saying, okay, why hasn't anyone else managed to pull this off? Um, learn from their fails. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that, that's a technique that uh, works quite well for me on a number of projects is, okay, see, I have had this idea. I'm probably not the first to have this idea. Why did everybody else fail to do it? And what can I do that is not going to repeat their problems? Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, and DARPA have also pursued this in the early days as well. Is that correct? Where did they go wrong? Um, most of their projects were the uh, parallel plate thing. They, uh, did, they didn't do the analysis of getting the energy back into the system. Um, or some of them were like the the uh, nanocapacitor or looking into ways of doing nano manipulation, which was a completely different one. And, and those ways, they didn't go wrong. They actually succeeded. Okay. Can anything be done with that? Or has there anything... Has there been There's been done? some. Um, mo uh, most of it is still in the basic research phase, um, but the principles have been applied to um, do like some uh, cantilevers at the at nanoscale. Um, those are definitely a standard component. Uh, now, they're not useful for anything on their own, but they can be useful as part of a system. Kind of like a gear isn't, or a lever isn't useful for anything by itself, except unless you want an art object. But as part of a machine, it can work. Right. Okay. So this is just another type of component you can build stuff out of. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you've, you've mentioned that you had some scientists have a look at this, or professors. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. what did they say specifically other than just nodding and saying, hey, um, that should work? It could work, and it's worth an experiment. Right. I mean, they didn't have the funding, but they did know the field well enough to know to know if the experiments that had already been done would have ruled it out, and they do not, so. Right, okay. Did they have, were they, um, did they seem enthusiastic about the idea? Did, did they have any points about where they, they predict it will work and where it will go wrong without the experiments? Um, not so much. <laughs> yeah. uh, mostly it's just, th this wasn't their specific pet project, but they couldn't didn't see anything from what they knew that would cause this to go wrong. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, right. well, yeah. What what was it that inspired you to explore the engineering possibilities of the Casimir effect? Um, how do you, how do you to see if it could be done? Yeah, just to see. I mean, surely you think that there's like a useful engineering applications. Do you think they'd be near term or long term? Do you think if um. Near term uh, uh, implies having the ability to get the project done in the near term, and that's not going to happen at this point. Hmm. Um, now, e e even if um, the project were done tomorrow, though, uh, we're talking really, really small amounts of power for thousands of dollars. Yeah, na nanowatts for thousands of dollars. That is a curiosity. That is not a major, large engineering thing. So that's been part of the problem of attracting the funding is it's not immediately commercializable, so even it does, if it works. It doesn't seem to be able to compete with other ways of harnessing um, energy at the moment. Yeah, it's one its advantage current. is the fuel that, that it takes is already there. Yeah. Now, once the basic theory is done, there are some ways to scale it up. But first you have to prove the basics. Mm, okay, yeah. Yeah. So, so in in like maybe the dark side of the moon <laughs> could be a um, yeah. uh, a place where these things would be uh, useful, or you know, um, as a backup, you know, like on a spacecraft, if uh, other primary um, power sources go down, at least there's yeah. something. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. The use models are really like solar, except it doesn't have to have access to the sun. Yeah. It just produces power. Right. Well, or check it. it. It just 
converts power from an existing source not directly usable by electricity into electricity. Right. It's, it may not be concentrated, but how much, how much energy is there in virtual particles compared to something like radiation from the sun? Um, I don't have the exact figures off the top of my head, but suffice to say, either one of those is sufficiently large as to we don't worry about that. Like, how much energy is in the sun? Yes, it, 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 The sun in has the enough sun. energy to keep <laughs> going for millions and billions of years. Okay, well, let's say let let's let's get um, let's get science fiction about this. So, do you think this Casimir Casimir effect could be utilized on really really large scale um, projects, perhaps to halt the expansion of the universe or something like that? <laughs> Uh, first, we need to get proof of whether the universe is expanding or contracting. Mm -hmm. um, I'd rather not carry the speculation that far afield. Mm -hmm. um, first, Great. I need to because as it, as it is, just the immediate experiment, we don't know what's going to happen. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, it would be a great pl um, you know, tool for a science fiction uh story. Now, you've written some science fiction uh, that yeah. includes the Casimir effect. Do you want to discuss that briefly? Well, okay, so one of the possible ways that it would shake out um, is by draining the, uh, the, the, zero, the what's called zero-point field or zero-point effect field. Um, it could emulate having a negative mass or at least create some of the same properties and this would allow for the creation of what scientists call exotic matter, or at least virtual exotic matter, something that can actually be constructed, but has the properties of this otherwise unobtainable thing. Which then allows you to tweak physics in various interesting ways. Um, by analogy, you got things like materials, which allow for negative refractive index, where you, you have a, a lenses that bend light in the opposite way of what an actual lens does. Hmm. Okay, and what would that um, And so likewise here, you have something that can emulate a negative mass and thus effectively uh, give the, the properties of exotic matter without actually having to have it. Right. And then the scientific applications of that, well, TBD, but once you have the basics, then people can explore. Hmm. Okay. Did you explore these uh, possible applications? You're breaking up again. Did you explore these possible applications in your science fiction? Um, one of them. Uh, one, uh, one theory, for instance, of how you could create a wormhole is if you had a very large ring of exotic matter, or two of them, uh, start, start them to close together, spin them in opposite directions. Some theories say that a wormhole might be formed between them, So, and then if you break those rings apart, uh, you would have the wormhole from one point to the other. So, okay, what if you have that? Um, and then what if you say, take one of these rings, accelerate it at sublight, so take 10 years to go out to Alpha Centauri, then all of a sudden you have a wormhole stretching from wherever you put one in, like say Earth orbit, out to Alpha Centauri. And you can just pop over there, assuming you can go through the wormhole without uh, any major problems. Um, and there's gravitational tides and other effects that may cause that to be a problem. For the sake of the science fiction, I kind of hand waves that and assume that the construction um, uh, includes the necessary equipment to make a stable part, and you just really don't want to touch the edge of the wormhole. Mm -hmm. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, okay, okay, well, that's that's interesting. Um, well, if you... Since you're not really working on, uh, you don't have the funds to really work on a project uh, implementing or testing the Casimir effect, is there any competition? Is there anybody else working on this? Or something similar? Uh, not this specific project, no. Mm -hmm. um, then again, there, how many people are working on um, quantum mechanics and actual engineering projects involving quantum mechanics? There are some people making some good progress, but there's not that many people in the world working on it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Probably well, less than a hundred thousand all told. Okay. As opposed to, or as far as actual engineering projects, mm -hmm. uh, as opposed to just 
theory and writing papers about it and so on and so forth. I'm talking people who are actually in a fab, actually making devices and exploring the possibilities. Mm. Um, and this includes like the people make, uh, making the quantum computers, the qubits you may have heard of. D-Wave? Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yes, I'm including D-Wave in, the, in that. Uh, mm. Their engineering staff. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's an interesting um, thing. D-Wave, I think originally they had a bit of flack. People didn't really think that they were doing anything good at all. It was all just hocus pocus. Um, one of their largest critics went to visit their lab and uh, retracted some earlier comments that he'd, he'd made. Um, and I don't know if he's really you know, batting for their side now or not, but it seems interesting. Uh, that the, the Google have, have for instance, uh, bought their machines in the past and have recently bought a, a really large one. Do you know much about that? I haven't looked too much into that. Um, my experience is that most of the applications for quantum computing are not quite the projects that I've been working on. Mm. Yeah. So mm. <laughs> I only have so much, so many hours in a day. <laughs> I mean. That, the reason I got bags under my eyes right now is because I was up too late last night reading and researching on uh, some related projects. Okay. Yeah. Right. So, what were those projects? If if you can if you can divulge, <laughs> they're a little classified right now. <laughs> All right. We'll look forward to hearing the unclassified versions once. Uh, yeah. Once they're ready. Um, so. Well. So what technical arguments would you would decrease your confidence in the possible engineering as applications of the Cosima effect? Um, and what are the well, best at this, critiques? At this point, it's basically have to do the experiment at some point. And no further uh, speculation or development until we can get the experiment done and prove it yes or no. And if we prove no, then we find out why it's a no, and what science can we do off of that. Uh, there's useful data to be, to be generated no matter what the outcome of the experiment is. Mm -hmm. But that's part of the problem with basic science is you don't have the immediate engineering applications. You're doing it just to find out what's there. And only once you've found out what's there can you think of really what to do with it in any solid, concrete, systematic way. Mm -hmm. So the Casimir effect um, requires uh, the a minimum thickness of material, so it wouldn't work if it was really, really small. Um, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, because yeah, uh, if you ha if it's like one atom thick, uh, th these particles, some of the particles could pass through. Right. Um, and remember I said 10 to 50, uh, sorry, 30 to 50 nanometers? That's around the sweet spot of uh, where it's small enough that the Casimir effect actually is measurable, but thick enough that it actually happens. Um, if you take it down to like one nanometer, that's probably going to be too thin. You're probably going to start having particles hopping through. Um, five, you, you could possibly, you could still get that. And actually, five would generate a much stronger effect than 30 to 50. And on the other hand, five nanometers is a lot harder to generate to manufacture than 30 to 50. At the moment, yeah. Uh, no, period. Um, even today, it is easier to manufacture something 10 millimeters thick than 1 millimeter thick, generally. The same thing applies for the nanometers, for pretty much the same reasons. Okay. Um, all right, well, so you mentioned that, um, some rings that spin at very high speeds. Is there um, a maximum speed? <laughs> that, that, uh, yeah, that, that's another possible danger. Um, so the ar the architecture requires that the rings uh, spin fast to in a magnetic field to generate electricity. Um, and so how fast is fast? It's fast enough, and I'm not going to cite numbers here, but I'm, it's fast enough that it may exceed the structural integrity of some of uh, some of the materials we're thinking of using. Okay. Uh, it, it's a standard problem with uh, high-speed flywheels, mm -hmm. just at very small scales. Yeah, okay, well, let's then talk about the second law of thermodynamics, and I'm sure a lot of people have had this in their head already, um, but how does your application or engineering uh, of the Casimir effect get around this, or, or other possible, uh, um, yeah, 
to other, so how does uh, your well, other possible engineering it gets around it by not being a closed system hmm. um, the, the technical name for this is the Casimir effect converter not it's not a generator not actually a generator all it does is convert energy from one form to another um, the energy is supplied by the universe um, and the system of the converter and the universe itself is closed. But the system of just the converter by itself, that's open. Hmm. So it's kind of like saying, okay, so how can a gas burning car produce electricity, er, produce energy to go? Well, you refuel it every, every so often, so it's, uh, it's not a closed system because you keep putting energy into it hmm. in, the for, in the form of gasoline, and it comes out and the form of kinetic motion. Hmm. So it's not like, um, but with this, it's not like there's a, a like a gas station that that you need to stop off at every now and again. There's like gas stations everywhere. Um. It, 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 yeah, pretty much. Or actually, a better analogy would be: say you're flying a plane and you have a tanker hooked up. Hmm. Yeah. But you're just looking at the plane. And you're and you're quietly ignoring this tanker that keeps pumping energy, pumping gas into you. Well, likewise here. Well, okay. Um, well, I'm going to start asking about other related um, possible future uh, engineering. Uh, uh, you're breaking up again, but you yeah, yeah, sorry, um, other um, energy is, applications. Yeah, yeah. Is there anything else you'd like to conclude on the Casima effect? Um, right now, or do you want to move on to other interesting engineering possibilities? Eh, let's move on. Okay. I mean, well, one one final remark is that the patent is out there, and I'll give you the numbers, or I'll give you a link to the uh, USPTO mm -hmm. so you can put it in the description. Definitely, yes. Um, so people can see the exact technical uh, nature of this, and they can see, okay, this is exactly how it works. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. I mean, uh, but it, it, let's, let's be honest here. That's why I did the patent on this. So there would be a publication of record for exactly how this works or is proposed to work. Yeah. Awesome. So, okay. Anyway, so other engineering, er, other energy technologies. Um, after talking about all that, my, my second paper is actually a little mundane, um, and that's uh, large space-based solar. Mm. Uh, for instance, manufacturing several uh, solar panels using lun lunar materials. Mm -hmm. Now... I, the reason I favor that isn't even really because of the efficiencies of getting solar er, energy without an atmosphere in a way. It's more to do with, okay, let's say you have a factory on the moon. You are not going to get away with cheap labor in China because a factory on the moon doesn't have atmosphere. You don't have native population. You are going to automate it. Hmm. Also, there's lesser environmental regulations and a bunch of other things, which mean that if you start any decent, any viable effort to make energy uh, solar panels on the moon is inherently going to have a lot of the factors necessary to scale up. Mm -hmm. Which means that it's pretty easy to want to have a starter effort, just keep it going, keep manufacturing, keep grinding, automate it, let it crank 24 7, um, get up to kilometer, square kilometers tens of square kilometers, thousands of square kilometers, until eventually you're making so much energy that you have a substantial portion of the electricity needs of the human race. Mm -hmm. um, for and, and how would you been deliver it? That several hundred thousand square kilometers of uh, solar panels, and this is just one estimate, actually I think this is a little high, but it could provide enough electricity to uh, to uh, care for the entire uh, energy consumption of the human race uh, per year. Now, th this par partly gets into the problem of most of the energy is consumed in a mobile format, specifically gasoline, not mm -hmm. electricity, uh, because what's it get used for? Cars. Mm -hmm. And airplanes and ships, but cars is one of the big ones. Mm -hmm. um, so just providing the energy won't uh, make it, it, it that viable. On the other hand, if you provide enough energy, it becomes really cheap to manufacture artificial oil or synthetic oil, and from that synthetic gasoline, which 
puts a certain maximum price on how expensive gas can get. Um, people are talking these days about three buck a, ga- a gallon, four buck a gallon, five buck a gallon. Well, what happens if you introduce a manufacturing technology which can get gasoline consistently for two bucks a gallon? If the real ga- oil gets expensive enough that it ever goes above that, it's all of a sudden price capped. Mm. Mm-hmm. And once you have that, most likely um, economies of scale and further technological development and so on and so forth are going to push gas down or price of gas down regardless of any politics, what happens with the sources of the real oil, whatever. If you have a manufacturing capacity in a politically stable area uh, producing something that the world demands, guess what? It's probably going to build more of it. Standard economics. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. So, I mean, that would be interesting if it could happen, if we could uh, sort of uh, generate that much electricity... That, that much energy up there, how do you suppose to transport the energy back down to Earth? Uh, there are a few ways. Um, one possibility is, of course, to manufa- manufacture the gas or whatever other energy form um, upstairs, uh, but where are you going to get the materials to make the gas from? Uh, one possibility is to manufacture antimatter, but that has its own poss- er, problems, not the least of which is the efficiency of going to antimatter in the first place, and then building useful antimatter reactors down here to get the energy back out. Uh, the most common approach uh, that's been proposed to get around all of this is just microwave it down, which is pretty viable. It, it, it has a few possible problems, um, especially if you don't section off the area. Uh, the main problem is that if you try it, uh, a bunch of people are going to try to protest. And some of these guys have threatened eco-terrorism acts. Mm-hmm. So what? So what happens if you have one of these protesters who says, "Hey, this this stuff is dangerous," and to prove it, he hops into the middle of the facility and fries himself to prove that it can kill someone. Well, yeah, technically he just killed someone, but that person was going out of his way to commit suicide. Mm-hmm. Right. And frankly, it's, that that's what happens with a lot of people. With a lot of how people propose that these new energy technologies might be dangerous, they're only dangerous if you go out of your way to make them harmful. Mm-hmm. Sure. I mean, nobody'd like it. Um, well, <laughs> not many people these days would like sort of climb a fence to get into like a um, an electricity generator and fire themselves just to prove a point these days. But new technologies, uh, which not are that scary. Specifically, but uh, you be dismayed. Some of the uh, tactics I've seen that people go to to try to prove these things dangerous when they aren't. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sure. Well, what do you think about helium three harvesting on the moon? As like, uh, you know, you've seen uh, those movies, right? Um, but helium three fusion needs to be made practical. Uh, of course, that's a kind of a chicken and the egg problem. Uh, how do you make helium-3 fusion practical when you don't have much helium-3 and, well, there isn't that much on the Earth? Uh, and until you actually make it practical, if you mine a bunch of helium-3, who are you going to sell it to? Mm. And that's over and above the problem of just getting fusion to be uh, pro- energy productive in the first place. They only last year finally achieved breakover, and that's just on a deuterium-tritium reactor. Helium three is a lot more energy intense, mm-hmm. and it's really on only on the surface of the moon. Is that correct? You can yeah. Only... Well, this is because it's been uh, deposited by the solar wind over the eons. So yeah. yeah, it's pretty much on the surface. Yeah, so it's not like you can just mine, keep on mining deeper and deeper. You have to keep on expanding, and the harvesters have to sort of travel large distances to keep on collecting helium three. How much is there? Is there enough to really uh, keep us going for a while? Do you think? Oh, easily, easily. Okay. Yeah. Um, thousands of years of supply, if you, and that's just on the moon. Of course, that's mm. gathering the entire moon, and that's uh, making certain assumptions about the uh, rate of human energy consumption over those thousands of years. Mm. Um, but it, it, even buying us a hundred years, that's more than enough time to expand to certain other places where there's going to be a bunch of helium three, mm. and then that's assuming that that becomes the only the only energy technology. Now, 
when did the first uh, real gasoline powered engine come into play? 19th century, roughly? 18th, maybe? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, and we're already talking about replacing it. Yeah. So, yeah, a few hundred years uh, until we get to whatever the next technology is. Sure. Yeah. Which brings into question, um, you know, there's a, is there, there's a lot of highly speculative um, possible future applications for, or fu future engineering um, possibilities for getting energy. We've mentioned in, like, a previous interview, um, Dyson spheres and mat matryoshka brains. Now, if, like, an advanced civilization would use these, um, looking at the speed of how quickly we're moving from one particular energy uh, source to the next, how long, like, do you think it's viable for these things to, to be useful? I mean, they, they, on one hand, they seem like it's a long-term energy harvesting technique uh, by just harvesting energy from the sun, which takes, like, you know, which, you know, gets us, could be good enough for the next billion years, next few billion years. Um, but... Well, yeah. What about like uh, other other energy sources that may like dwarf the efficacy of like uh, suns as uh, or stars as energy um, uh, as places to ener uh, harvest energy? Um. Yeah. That that gets into the, I forget the exact name. Kalishnikov, Kardashev. Um. But the type one, type two, type three, where you got Kardashev. Oh, using huh? Kardashev. Yeah, that's him. Uh, use it, uh, type 1 is all the energy on a planet or the equivalent amount. Type yep. 2 is the equivalent of the entire energy of a solar system. Type 3 is the equivalent of an entire energy of a galaxy and so on. Um, but beyond that kind of modeling, that, 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 that's just a way to describe it. That doesn't measure what you actually do with the energy or how you're actually getting the energy. Uh, for instance, it's been estimated that uh, humanity might become a type 1 at the point where it's harvesting is most of its energy from the sun rather than the earth. Sure. Um, now that's the equivalent of getting all the energy that the earth has to offer, even if you're not actually doing it. Mm -hmm. Right. Likewise, type two would probably wait until we're um, we find some practical method to go uh, to get beyond the stars. Whether that be some wor some workaround for a relativity of one of these few possible FTL things, if, if they, any of them work, um, or slow time um, sending probes out, say, to Alpha Centauri, again, at, at a 10-year loop, uh, five years at near sea there, uh, get a bunch of energy, fire it back, and it takes five years to get here. Okay, fine. If it takes 10 years to cycle, but we're still getting that energy, we're still getting that energy. Hmm. Do you think that the future of human um, civilization or person civilization, whatever form we might take, is that going to be um, an ex more of an expansion into the in, into the outskirts of the universe, um, galaxy by galaxy, or do you see it more like something like John Smart's um, STEM uh, hypothesis, sort of a transcendent hypothesis, some like to call it? So that one really, that that one is currently facing the problem of how to deal with a civilization over significant uh, inter astronomical timescales. Mm. Uh, for instance, just going up to the moon, you got a a, a, a significant uh, light speed delay uh, communicating back and forth. Uh, going to Mars, even more so. And just within the solar system, you get several light minutes from furthest point to furthest point. So how do you deal with the communication delay and keep it a single culture uh, when going from star to star? And if you don't do that, why would anyone want to go to another star? <laughs> and there's a lesser form of that for why would anyone want to go to another planet? Mm. Uh, people have cited various reasons. Most of them don't actually pan out. Mm. Like, for freedom. Freedom to what? Starve? For freedom to uh, uh, float around in a vacuum? Nobody, uh, nobody in their right mind wants that, um, unless they're actually doing something for people they care about. Mm. Um, it, it, even just the initial space colonization effort, you have to make it make economic sense for people to be up there, 
And that's hard to do just for Earth orbit, let alone another planet. Um, that's a problem that needs to be solved for before there will be much expansion um, beyond the solar system. It, it, it can kind of be waved around and work around for various destinations within the solar system, but unless a good solution comes to that, I don't see humanity getting off of the star unless we're kicked off. <laughs> I mean, uh, uh, th th this is why you have so many uh, 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 stories of colonizing other stars, uh, starting with Earth died and therefore people got out, because people were forced out. Mm -hmm. Because if they're still on Earth, then there is a mighty attraction to stay here, where everybody else is, where people are still talking. So, I mean, like, that's assuming that we don't, um, we, we, we haven't worked out how to um, utilize entanglement for communication, uh, to, um, to get over communication speeds and things like that. But entanglement can... uh, is one of these widely misunderstood things. Hmm. I mean, okay, let me explain quantum entanglement real quickly. Yeah. So, you got two particles, you know, one of them is in one state, one of them is in the other state, but you don't know which one is which. Yeah. Then you split them apart, take them apart a bit. You measure one. You see it's in this state. So you know the other one's in this state. And somehow, magically, you know this instantly, um, despite the fact that the information doesn't take light speed delay to communicate to you, you know it instantly. But that's all, that's all it is. is you know the, uh, you know the um, information. You don't actually act on it. You're not actually, you're not actually communicating anything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, you could, so in the process of observation, um, it flips. Uh, the bit the, the bit flips and um, yeah you, you you'll know that there's a change on the other side but um, just knowing that there's a change doesn't mean you can communicate information yeah but can't can't you build patterns of these uh, sort of uh, you know isn't there some sort of configuration of pa um, like a uh, entangled particles that could represent data being th uh, sent over not unless you have control over th these. Right, and and the problem is you can't have control because in order for control you need to observe, you need to um, interfere, and that right. And the moment you interfere, uh, the entanglement goes away. Yeah, yeah. Mm. That or you have you have fixed it, and then you fix it before you can do any controlling over it. Mm. Right. So if you can if you can determine what state it was in before you actually observe it during the process of communication, um, then yeah. You can then, uh, well, I guess, yeah, I don't know. Look, it's it's beyond me. <laughs> but let's... And, and further, um, so yeah, you had the particles entangled. The mm. the quote unquote communication happened when the particles were taken apart at light speed or less, mm. uh, less than light speed because they have mass. Mm -hmm. So, do you think that it's possible, um, more plausible to use um, manufactured wormholes? To try to uh, communicate over li large distances. Um, insofar as it's potentially theoretically possible, if you can find a way to do more holes, mm. as opposed to already proven pretty much uh, pretty much a non-starter. Uh, yeah, I'd say wormholes are uh, more plausible, but th this is a highly relative thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, like in terms of uh, the future of life in the universe, we brought up John Smart's uh, STEM hypothesis. So this is getting really small. D have you done much reading? Uh, I, I think I remember you commenting on some topic about that in the extropian list. I, I'm not sure, right? Um, it was brought up a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. Yeah, I, ha I haven't uh, done that much reading on the STEM hypothesis specifically. Yeah, sure. Yeah. All right. Well, um, yeah, it's it's uh, been a, a whirlwind of topics at the end there. I'm trying to discuss uh, what what the future will hold for expansion into the universe, how we're going to power that expansion, and how we're going to keep a a relative distance uh, so that we can communicate over um, effectively over these distances without uh, um, without the distance being a uh, an impediment to the culture of the society we're trying to achieve in the future. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so, I mean, I don't know how to get around that myself, but I, I, you know, I have this general feeling that we're going to 
invent something that might be able to be exploited. Uh, we'll, we'll find something in the universe we can exploit to um, help us travel outside the, the bounds of this solar system without having to worry about communication speeds, or maybe we just won't value it, value communication over those long distances. We'll just trust. <laughs> what would an AI do? I don't know. Oh, and what what type of AI? How fast is it? Uh, what norms do they have? Mm, that's true. Well, is there anything else you'd like to um, talk about the Casima effect or other engineering possi possibilities to harvest energy in the future? Any concluding mm. remarks? Well, so um, I'll just make again get back to the point about the uh, large uh, solar or, or, or large lunar. Uh, uh, Lunar materials to make a large solar. Uh, this is part of the reason why I believe space industrialization um, should be one of uh, humanity's top priorities right now, is to enable the collection of uh, energy resources and other resources um, outside of our atmosphere uh, so that A, we can get a lot more of them, and B, we can stop uh, messing up down here. Sure. So I mean, like we have backup civilizations, <laughs> and if we well, not, if, not, not just backup yeah. civilizations, but uh, a, this is partly an environmentalist plea mm -hmm. of okay, if we can get um, like gigawatts or terawatts of solar power pumped into uh, humanity's energy supply, then that means we don't have to burn as much coal and oil. Yeah, yeah. So it doesn't. We're not. We're not and there's polluting. There's a lot of people who are going to be very unhappy with us burning a lot of coal and oil, but. Come on, this isn't about making a few people rich. This is about making a better world, not just for our children to live in 100 years from now, but for us to live in 100 years from now. If anybody didn't notice how long people are living and how human lifespans are getting longer. Mm. I mean, my mom is currently doing a PhD on gerontology, and she has been pointing out for years how lifespans keep increasing and how... A lot of people, possibly even the majority of uh, people in America and most Western civilizations today, can expect to live to be 100. Mm. Now, a, ma a majority, not everybody by any means, mm. but mm -hmm. still. Mm. And what's this going to do to uh, retirement, to Social Security, to Medicare? And what's this going to do if nobody prepares for that? And further, what's this going to do to our world if we haven't, if we think, okay, it's okay if we mess up because we're going to die in 10, 20, 30 years, um, and then our children can deal with our mess. Well, no. What if we have to be the ones to clean up our mess 10, 20, 30 years from now? Mm -hmm. Makes it a bit, little bit more uh, urgent then, yeah. <laughs> right? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, people t don't, don't really. Yeah, uh, and so if we can um, start uh, getting the space industrialization up to start uh, taking advantage of these cleaner and better power sources, things are going to be a little bit better when, uh, um, for us in, in the, our extended lifespans. Hmm. So, so it seems like it's a, an interesting in intermediate stage to even larger um, engineering possibilities. If if you were to speculate on what the next engineering possibility beyond um, solar harvesters on the moon um, would be, well, helium three fusion, like you said, yeah. is definitely a possibility. Mm, yeah. um, and now, granted, that's a mind view. Um, another one I'm looking at is okay. What happens if we get enough energy that antimatter becomes viable as a battery? Right. How does that work? Yeah, of course, that also gets into the problem of any vehicle sufficiently powerful to be interesting in space uh, is also a weapon. Hmm. And, yeah, antimatter can be a pretty powerful um, explosive if uh, mishandled. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Then again, any um, sufficiently de dense energy storage mechanism, even chemical, is explosive if handled improperly. Right. You, you you see some of these batteries exploding. It's because they contain so much energy. Mm -hmm. Just like if you put a, a, a spark in a, a gas tank, mm -hmm. it'll explode. Yeah, but the explosion uh, from an antimatter spacecraft might be very large, right? Well, it depends on how much you have. But yeah. Okay. Is it large enough what to take out the nearby planet? You can get to really, 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 really small amounts and uh, parcel those out. Mm 
So like t- today's D cell, uh, or, 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 or sorry, tomorrow's D cell might be about what a double A cell is today. Right. So um, it's batteries. Uh, the the growth of uh, efficacy of batteries. Yeah, you're very of, the growth, uh, yeah, yeah, the, the the usefulness of batteries, or the the amount of energy that they can store and 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 one hasn't really increased at the same speed as like you know processor speed, for instance. Um, do you think that being, do you think that's always going to be a problem? Do you think like uh, energy storage and harvesting is going to be a lot slower in development? Than... I think the factors behind increasing energy density are different and slower than the energy factors behind what's commonly called Moore's Law. Sure. Uh, and now people keep saying there's the end of Moore's Law in three or four generations, like eight years from now, but people have been saying that for the past 30, 40 years, and well, it's get, it kept going so far, which isn't to say that it isn't about to stop now, just that it, it, people have never been able to see how it's going to continue more than 10 years, even when it does continue more than 10 years. Right. Right, and, um, but the factors for that are different than the factors behind um, energy density, and especially, I, I, I'm wondering if we're starting to run into the limits of what's possible to store with uh, pure chemical batteries. Uh, superconductive loops uh, and superconductors are definitely one possible uh, replacement, and that's not going to be an incremental. That's going to be a step function mm-hmm. for uh, how much energy density you can get. Okay. But um, you, you mentioned Moore's law. Um, I think Moore's law specifically relates to how many uh, transistors you can fit on a chip. Um, yeah, so transistor density may um, peter out. May, maybe you can't go beyond a certain, like you know, a, a number of uh, nanometers, right? So, but you can also increase the size of the chip if you can get cooling systems right. Mm-hmm. Mm. What's your thoughts on reversible computing, too? Do you think it's possible? Um, or do you think it's uh, just purely theory? Never be engineered? I, I think it's possible. I do wonder about uh, the applications for it, though, because I definitely don't think it's going to be possible to be a drop-in replacement for uh, the current computing architecture. Mm-hmm. Sure. Yeah. Because, well, it, it, what, uh, how do you get a useful result out? And then once you have the output... Well, how do you reverse that? Hmm. Hmm. Even if you make a copy, well, that copy is no longer reversible, even if you reverse everything else. So, hmm. are you, are you, and is the energy necessary to put in that copy uh, going to outweigh the energy you're saving by doing this reversible computing as opposed to current computing architecture? Mm-hmm. I don't think it will, at least de- definitely not first generations anyway. Okay, that's interesting. All right, well, um, yeah. I think, uh, yeah, we, we've, we've covered a lot of ground. <laughs> yep. Yeah, so, so thanks so much, Adrian. It's been really a pleasure talking to you and, and about your uh, your Cosimo, um effect, uh, like uh, engin- experiments you've done. Uh, I'm, hope- I'm hoping that you can continue those and you get the funding that you need. Um, and so if any- anybody here is watching this video and is interested in, uh, in, per- in, in exploring this further, what can they do? All right, well, there's that, there's CubeCab, which I mentioned in the previous segment. Uh, there are a few other projects that I've been working on. And frankly, if someone have used this five years from now, I'm probably going to be working on quite a few other projects, and that's how things go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's great. Awesome. All right, well, it's been a pleasure. I'll, yeah, I'll just end the interview here, unless there's anything yeah. else you'd like to say. No. Uh, all done. <laughs> Cheers. Yep.